The moment we've all been waiting for is finally here. Congratulations, class. We did it. We were born into a tragedy, September 11th, of course, and now we're graduating during the pandemic. There's no class greater than us. There's no class stronger than us. This pandemic has prepared us for whatever else the world decides to throw our way. I wish you all the best, and I know each and every one of my classmates will go on and do great things. I wouldn't want to graduate with anybody else. I love you guys, and I wish you the best. Always and forever, class of 2020. This is Always Be by an unknown poet. Always be understanding to your enemies, be loyal to your friends, be strong enough to face the world each day, be weak enough to know that you cannot do everything alone. Always be generous to those who need your help, be frugal, frugal with that you need yourself, be wise enough to know that you do not know everything, be smart enough to continue learning, always be willing to share your joys, be willing to share the sorrows of others, be a leader when you see a path others have missed, be a follower when you are shrouded by the mists of uncertainty. Always be the first to congratulate an opponent who succeeds. Be last to criticize a colleague who fails. Be sure where your next step will fall so that you will not tumble. Be sure of your final destination by setting your goals along the way. Above all, always be yourself. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we come to you right now as humble as we know how. God, we come into you thanking you for your grace and for your mercy, oh God. God, we thank you for these seniors, oh God, that have accomplished a milestone in their life, oh God. God, despite that it have been a, a tough year, oh God, we realize that you're still in control, oh God, and that these seniors are still special to you, oh God. God, we love you, oh God. We love what you say in your word. If you be for us, then who can be against us, oh God? Oh God, let these seniors know that they can can go in the world and be who they want to be, that they can have their mind set on what they want to do. Oh God, we love you on today, God. We thank you on today, oh God. God, we thank you for a, a successful year for these seniors, oh God. And God, we just pray that blessings fall down in their life, oh God. God, we pray a hedge of protection all around them in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lead them on the right path oh God. God, keep them in your will, oh God. God, we love you. God, we thank you for every single oh God. Touch every singer right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Oh God, move in a mighty way in their life, oh God. God, let them know they can do all things in your name because you give us the strength, oh God. And God, we can look to the hills from which come at our help. From all our help come from you. And God, we love you on today. We're thankful for you because your name is mighty. Your name is worthy of all of the praise. And God will continue to give you all the glory, the honor, and truly all of the praise. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good afternoon and congratulations to the class of 2020 from Spalding High School. Uh, we are so proud of you and grateful for you. If you are a student of a, or, and a graduate or a parent or family member or friend tuning in uh, or faculty or um, whoever else, uh, I'm just honored to be here with you. My name is Josh Abernathy. I'm the pastor at City Church, which is a, we're about a year old church plant in Griffin, Georgia. And I'm excited and thankful that I get a chance to be a part of, the, of these moments with you. And so today, I, I just want to hopefully encourage you, hopefully challenge us a little bit. And, uh, and I think it's going to be fun. And so again, thank you uh, for having me. I'm honored uh, that uh, I get to be a part of this with you. So I had a friend um, a couple years ago that received a phone call. And it was from a lawyer. And the lawyer began to ask him, hey, is this so-and-so? And he had him identify a couple things with him. He said, okay, I'm going to send you some stuff um, just to make sure that, you're, that you are who you say you are. And so after a process, he came through and he said, hey, listen, you had a distant relative um, in London that passed away, and you are next in line to actually inherit his castle. <laughs> and my friend said, excuse me? And he said, yeah, you have a castle that is now in your name. Um, that is worth a ton of money. And it blew us away. It blew him away. And so just for a second, I want to ask you to step into this world where someone calls you and begins to um, offer you and say, you have this amount of money coming your way. So let's just, let's just say right now that someone called you and said, hey, I have a check for you for $31,500,000. $31,536,000. What would you do? Okay, let's scale it down a little bit. What if someone called you and said, hey, I have a check written for you for $21,024,000. What would you do with that amount of money? Let's scale it down just a little bit. What about $10,500,000? It's still a lot of money. What would you do with that much? Okay, let's scale it down just a little bit more. $5,256,000. Still a ton of money right there. What would you do with it? What about this? What if someone called you and had, with a check and said, I've got a check for you for $525,600. It's still a lot of money. What would you do with that much money. I'm sure you could dream of a ton of things that you could do with that much money, whether you are uh, a family member or a graduate watching right now. I mean, we could, we, could, we could come up with a lot of things to do with even $525,000. It's funny how our value system works, because so often we work and work and work and work to get more and more money in our bank account, because we believe that that's the most valuable thing. I mean, money makes the world go round, right? But what if our value, value system shifted? What if it changed a little bit? Because I can probably guarantee you this. No one's going to call you. I mean, I hope that they do. Oh, my goodness, I hope that this happens to you. But no one's going to call you and say, hey, I've got a check for $31 million for you. Probably not going to call you and say, I've got a check for $5 million for you. Maybe even not. I mean, I hope it could happen to you, but I've got a check for $525,000 for you. But the funny thing is, over the next year, you have 525,600 minutes. And let's just say that you live for the next 10 years, you have 5,256,000 minutes in that time. If you live for 20 years, 10,512,000 minutes. 40 years. If you live for 40 more years, you have 21 million 24,000 minutes. And if you live for the next 60 years, you have 31,536,000 minutes in your, time, in, in your lifetime to do something with. While no one's maybe calling you and offering you a check, you actually are offered that amount. It's just a different currency. I mean, what would you do with 525,000 minutes? Because I can tell you this, the one thing that you and I share and have in common above all else is the breath that we just breathed and the minute that we just shared together. The one thing that we have in common moving forward is that we have the minutes that have been entrusted to us. I think it's God's way of reminding us that we all have intrinsic 
an incredible amount of value because we were created in his image. So he gives us the breath in our lungs to experience the minutes and moments in our lives. So the question that I want to pose to you today is what would it look like if you viewed your minutes and your moments as the most valuable currency that you have? I don't, I don't know what the next couple years are going to look like. For some of you, you're going to go off to college. Others of you, you're going to jump into a trade and you're going to start working and making money. Uh, maybe uh, you, you're going to enlist. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. But what I do know is that every single one of us, the one thing we have in common is that we have these mem- minutes to do something with. If you look at any powerful movement that has ever happened, it was marked by significant moments that whoever the leaders of that movement were chose to take advantage of and to leverage. And our life is, a, is measured by a series of moments. So today, I don't want to ask you what you're going to do with your first paycheck. I actually want to ask you what you're going to do with the next amount of minutes that you have that are coming up over the next few years. Because honestly, one minute is more powerful than one dollar. So when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school, and I was being recruited for bat- to play basketball at a lot of Division I um, universities. And uh, there were scholarships that were being discussed. And so I got invited to a, a basketball camp, an elite basketball camp at Clemson University. And so um, I was there at this camp and was playing, and it was about a three-day camp, and there were just a lot of games happening. And so I stayed up late one night um, after uh, – just after curfew and everything, I was hanging out in the dorms and just being just a junior in high school. And I was exhausted. And we had an 8 a.m. game the next morning, and I was playing terrible. I was, it was awful. I was missing shots that I should have been making. I remember at one point I drove to the lane, and I went to lay it up, and I missed it, should have made it. And I just I lost my cool, and I went to the back of um, behind the backboard where the pole was, and there's, a, there's like a mat there. And I punched the mat, and I yelled out a word. And listen, a cuss word's a cuss word, but there are levels, I think, of of cuss words. And so I went to the top level, like, it's kind of like a big, go big or go home. It starts with the letter F, and I yelled it as loud as I could. The whole gym stopped. There were multiple games going on. The entire gym stopped and looked at me. And in that moment, every D1 coach that was there went to my coach or my dad afterwards and said, um, hey, we are uh, not gonna, going to be showing interest in your son anymore um, because we don't need someone like that that loses their cool that easy. I lost the interest of every Division I college, university in that one moment. One moment, one minute, one decision changed the opportunities and maybe, I don't know, the trajectory of my life because of that one moment. Our moments and our minutes are so incredibly powerful, and if you can agree with me, if you're here and you're agreeing, you're like, I get this, I understand, we're actually also in agreement with uh, a man who was an author of uh, a few of the um, books of the Bible in the New Testament. In fact, in one of the letters that he's writing to this church in Ephesus, he makes this, this point because he wants them to understand how important our moments are. It's in Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16, he says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So a few verses before this, Paul is writing to this church who is um, honestly has strayed a little bit and they're kind of living the, their life the, the way they want to. They're not taking a, a huge, putting a huge amount of focus on the minutes and the moments of their life and making the most of those. And so Paul is trying to get them to focus in. And a few verses before this, Paul says, um, hey, walk in love. And so he's, he's really putting this, um, this focus on their actions and what you do and the decisions and the choices that you make. And so as Paul's talking, as Paul's working through this, he begins to, to go down a list of kind of right and wrongs, like moral decisions that we should make and that we shouldn't make. And so he's trying to get us to understand, again, every moment is filled with uh, packed with decisions that are going to, to change and affect the course of your life. So he goes like right and wrong, but then he kind of ups the ante. The way I, that, I, that I look at it is if you go to the gym and you're about to bench press, and so you get on the bench, you get on the bench press, and it's just the bar there. And so you bench press and it's just, you just bench press the bar, so it's 45 pounds. But then you start adding weight on. 
right, to push yourself a little bit more. I think when we walk through this passage, Paul just says, okay, let's start with the bar. Walk in love. So let's add some weight to how we understand our, our, our moments and our minutes. So there are right and wrong decisions. But then he starts adding more weight because I think he wants us to understand the weight of the minutes that we've been given. And so he says, well, they're not actually right and just right and wrong. Paul says they're actually choices and decisions of death and life. He's trying to add more weight to the moments that we have been given. So Paul says they're not just moral decisions. They're life and death decisions. And so when, when, when we leverage a moment to bring life and to make the right choices that affect those around us and also us, we actually breathe life into whatever situation, whatever relationships that are a part of that. I'm adverse when we, when we choose to do things that may be selfish or aren't the wisest choices. What Paul says is you actually don't make the wrong choice. You actually make a decision where you bring death into the situation. See, there's a lot more that he's adding to this whole idea of these moments. So he goes and he says, it's not just right and wrong, it's actually death versus life. So therefore, look carefully, verse 15. This idea of carefully is, uh, it, it also the other word for it is circumspectly, so 360 degrees. It's almost like if you had, if you had eyes, you, you have eyes on the, you're looking ahead, but as you're walking, you also, if your mom or dad ever said, I got eyes on the back of my head, you had eyes in the back of your head, then eyes on the side, so you could see around your entire life as you are walking. Paul says, do the same thing with your, with your life. Leave no stone unturned. Look at your entire life and the decisions you're making. It, as you move forward in the next few years, you are going to figure out, and you've already found out probably, that you can make choices in your life in the dark that no one else knows about. Behind closed doors that maybe no one else will know about. What Paul is saying, even those choices affect who you are and who you're becoming. So look carefully, 360 degrees, how you walk, meaning just how you live. This is, a, this is an action base. So even someone who couldn't physically walk, Paul is saying, no, how you live your life. Be careful. 360 degrees, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of time. This idea of time is just the succession of moments compiled together. So what Paul wants us to understand that each moment we have has a special mission because the days are evil because there is temptation as you move forward in your life. And as we all move forward, I'm 36 right now, and I, I still, every day, there are temptations to choose wrong and right to bring death or life into situations. And Paul's saying that that is what it is, that your moments, they matter, and they matter here, and they matter now. So I just want to kind of, I want to give you a couple challenges Real fast, just some things to think about as you walk into this week and as you walk into, honestly, the rest of your lives. The first one is this, is that your moments are a gift. Do this with me real fast. We're going to do this virtually since we're not here in person together. I want you to breathe in and then breathe out. You see, that breath that we just shared was a gift. And many of us will say, well, I breathed in and I breathed out. I did that. But I think we missed the point that there was someone who created us in a way that allowed us to, to do what we just did and to continue to breathe as we are watching this in these moments. You see, there's this creator that, that, that put our bodies together in such a way that allows us to continue to walk and to live and to breathe. These are gifts. And I think it's important that we understand and we are reminded that gifts only should and hopefully will point us back to the giver of the gift. Because it's one thing to be thankful for the breath in our lungs, but it's another thing to be grateful for the one who gives us the breath in our lungs. Because the danger is that if the gift becomes more important than the giver, then the gift can become a curse. So even in our lives right now, if we fail to realize that the breath in our lungs and the moments that we've been given are, are not just a gift, but there is someone that has given those to us, when it draws us to that greater picture, when it draws us to the fact that God created us to have these moments, then it allows our life to have meaning and to have a mission. But if the gift, our moments become more important than the giver, the one who give the, gave those to us, entrusted those to us, um, then then it can become a curse. 
Your moments are a gift. The second thing I would tell you is your moments are yours. Yes, they've been given to you, but your moments are yours. So a few uh, years back, I was in the gym, and I was running on a treadmill. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a gym before, but there is treadmill etiquette. At least there's treadmill etiquette where uh, w- what I believe there to be. And so if you're, on, if you're in a gym and there's 10 treadmills and you're on a treadmill and someone else comes up to another treadmill, if there are open treadmills, you should at least leave one treadmill in between you. Like there should be a gap between that. And so I'm on this treadmill. There's 10 treadmills and I'm the only one using a treadmill. And so this guy walks up to me. Um, and he gets on the treadmill right beside me. I'm like, listen, man, you are in my personal space. Do you not know treadmill etiquette? I wanted to press stop on my treadmill and just talk to him for a second and maybe lecture him, but I just let it go. So I'm just walking, and I'm just on there. I'm not on there to run. I'm not a runner. I'm just on there to get loosened up, to get warmed up. It was early in the morning. I need to get the blood flowing. And so I'm just, I, you know, I'm just, I'm a brisk walk. I'm in a brisk walk. And as I am walking, um, I, I begin to kind of pick it up to a jog. And I notice something that the guy that's beside me, I don't know this guy. The guy that's beside me, he bumps up his, uh, his, his speed to the speed that I had on my treadmill. So now all of a sudden we're going at the same speed. And I think nothing of it. Maybe he's got the same routine that I do. And so then I bump mine up a little bit more. So like I think I was at three, so I bump it up to like 4.5 maybe. And so all of a sudden he, beep, 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 beep 4.5. So I'm like, okay, this is, uh, something's happening right now. So I bump it up to five. Five speed, five, six, six. And before I know it, I, I have now entered into a race. Like I am racing with this guy beside me. I don't know if he knows it. I think he knows. He knows what he's doing. He knew treadmill etiquette. He, he invited me into a challenge, into a race. I didn't get on here to race, but I'm going to race now because I'm competitive. So, so I go up to 6.5, and so he goes up to 6.5. At this point, we're going. Like this is happening right now. We are in a full-on race to nowhere because we're on a treadmill, but we're going. And so I go up to seven. So then he goes up to seven, and then we're just going at it. I'm like, I got nothing left in my tank. And so all of a sudden, he goes on, he puts an incline on the treadmill. And so now there's this incline going up. And so now we're running up a hill, and I'm like, well, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna lose this. So I put up the incline. So now we're on incline on seven, just getting at it. We're going now. And all of a sudden, my knee locks up, and my feet go out from under me, and by the grace of God, I grabbed onto the treadmill, and so I'm just, it's just dragging me, and I had like shin burns from where the treadmill was just uh, going on my legs. It was awful, it was embarrassing, and also I lost the race, and he just kept on running. That smug look on his face, like I know exactly what I did. Yeah, you did. You knew exactly what you did. As I go back at that moment, I didn't get on the treadmill to, to, to win a race. I didn't get on a treadmill to even run. I got on a treadmill just to jog. But the moment that I stopped looking at what was in front of me and what I was supposed to be doing and I started paying attention to the person beside me is the moment that I got off track. Your moments are yours. I, I just want to be honest. The, best, the, the easiest way for you to miss out on the life that God has for you is to start comparing your life to other people. Instead of running your race the way that actually the writer of Hebrews talks about, there's a race set before us. Instead of running your race, you choose to look to the side and look at someone beside you. And you decide to start comparing your life and saying, I got to be like that. I got to beat them. I got to be better than them. Now, there's going to be moments when you, walk, you look at someone in your life and you, you start to compare your life and it actually encourages you. But I would, enc- I would encourage you to, re- to remember that that person's running their race and they're leveraging their moments. But you have your moments and they are yours. And there's also going to be other moments where you're going to look at someone else's life and say, well, it looks like they're having a lot more fun than I am, but they're not making the best decisions. And their choices are going to alter the, the impact and the trajectory of their life. You need to be reminded that your moments are yours. So steward them and use them in the way that God has called you to, making the right choices, the life-giving choices. Don't compare your life to other people. Compare your life to what God has called you into and what he's invited you into because that's when you're going to experience the best life possible for yourself. Your moments are a gift from the giver, and your moments are yours. And the last thing I will tell you is that your moments make you dangerous. Your minutes, they make you dangerous, and here's why. If they're as important as Paul makes them to be, as there's moments of death in life, I get to bring death and life into situations, then your moments make you dangerous because your moments are yours and you get to leverage those to change and make an impact. And I believe that your moments, when we choose to make the right choices in each minute and each moment, then those moments can become a movement in your life. 
a movement that will allow you to experience the goodness of God, the grace of God, moments to experience his blessing and his favor. Also be moments for you to experience heartache and pain, but know that there's a bigger purpose and meaning to those. Your moments are yours. Your moments are a gift. And your moments make you dangerous in the best way possible. Because uh, there's an enemy out there, and, and he wants to tear you down. He wants to divide us. And so the moment we choose to use the minutes to, that God has given us to bring life, to bring hope into the world, then we get to experience what God intended to it for us to experience. So would you choose your moments, would you leverage to use your moments to do good, to bring life, to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the grace and the hope of Jesus to this world? That's what we need. That's what this world needs is a generation that matters to them. Because it, it is not the tick of the clock that measures time, but it is the deeds which we crowd into that time. It's not a clock that measures the time that goes around, but I believe that it's it's, it's the minutes and the moments and it's the actions and the deeds that we put into those moments that change everything. So would you choose to see the moments you've been given as the greatest currency that you could possess? They're yours. Leverage them. Do, use them for good. Use them to bring life into the situations because that is what God is inviting us into. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for every graduate. Thank you for every person that is here, every person that is watching right now. God, I pray that you would allow us to see that what you have given to us is so important. And it's the breath in our lungs. It's the moments of our day. God, would you, by your grace and your mercy, God, would you help us and give us the courage and the strength and the power to use these things for good for your glory. God, would you help us even to see right now that maybe there's, you have a different purpose for our life. And so God, I'm just praying for the person that is realizing that now. God, may this be a graduating class and a generation of people who are moment makers. We love you. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. In your name we pray. Amen.